Uh, it's good to be here with everybody out here. So uh, I'll be talking about sandboxes. So sandboxing has been there for quite some time. So how many people use sandboxes? Uh, okay, how many people use browsers? So every browser has a sandbox, right? So uh, we part of kind of uh, sandboxing has become a, an integral part of what we do today uh, in our security lives and. Uh, even the uh, iOS, even the apps you get have an, a layer of sandboxing. So in this uh, talk, I'll be talking about uh, sandboxing on Windows operating system. But before I start, a little bit about myself. Uh, uh, I'm in a startup called Bromium. Uh, we kind of uh, launched this company around three years back. I guess it's not longer, not longer a startup anymore. It's three years old. But uh, before that, I have done a bunch of startups, mainly in the security world. Uh, my first startup was an IDS way back in 2000. Uh, and then I kind of uh, like to focus on offensive, defensive kind of security research. And uh, th this talk actually I presented at Blue Hat earlier last year and also at Black Hat in uh, Amsterdam. So this is a variation of that talk uh, and I would say an increment of my previous talks. So, uh, so the agenda is uh, I'll talk about sandboxes from an architectural perspective and uh, more, more from a security uh, architect or a pen tester's perspective, right? And then uh, we'll kind of categorize the various types of sandboxes we encounter uh, on a daily basis. And then uh, I'll kind of do some live exploit demos where we break out of every sandbox. And by, after we understand the architectural limitations of these sandboxes. Right? So the last part has uh, some uh, more fun stuff. The, f the first part is the, the gory details. Yeah. So, but I have to go through those. So what's a sandbox? Uh, I think if you have uh, kittens and cats, you might actually relate to this. Uh, this is also a sandbox, a real world sandbox. But uh, the sandbox, the whole concept of a sandbox is to create an environment where you can isolate a threat. Or, or you can run untrusted content, right? That's kind of the main goal of a sandbox. The idea is that you should be able to contain code so that it doesn't infect the user, right? Uh, so, so that in case, so you assume that whatever is coming inside the sandbox is an exploit or malware. So you have to assume that, right? It's untrusted. And uh, for this talk, uh, I'm going to be f talking only about application sandboxes. Uh, and. Uh, and for this talk, I've kind of divided it into two categories, type A and a type B. And it's kind of my own naming convention, type A, type B kind of sounds easy to remember. But uh, the idea is uh, there are two different types of uh, sandboxes broadly which you see in the markets. So type A is uh, sandboxy. How many of you have used sandboxy? It's been there for almost 10 years now, right? Uh, buffer zone uh, is another uh, product which is kind of not so popular, but it's, it's been there. And a recently lo launched product called Dell DDP, uh, Dell product. Can you talk about the, like, the web layer sandbox, like frame sandbox, whatever the, the web sandbox? Uh, no. So in that, so that's kind of the uh, HTML5 and all of those have those sandboxes. So I won't be talking about those, but I'm talking about the architecture of the implementation of a sandbox here. Yeah, it's very similar to type B, I would say. It's very similar to type B, uh, but the implementation details are a little bit different. And I will be actually talking about them later this year. Um, we're doing some research in that area, specifically for Windows 8 platforms, right? There's a lot of new stuff which is coming out there. So and type B is probably the most popular. Uh, Chrome, uh, I guess you use the Chrome browser, right? and Adobe Reader X, both of which are actually derived from the Chromium project. It's an open source project which Google bought several years back, and they are actually uh, what I call a type B sandbox. So what we'll do is I'll talk about these a little bit in details from an architectural perspective, and once we understand the limitations of the architecture, we'll do the exploitation fun stuff. So a uh, little, little bit digression here. So before we get into details, just a quick view of how operating system internals work. This is kind of how uh, the operating system Windows works, right? So you have two components broadly classified. One is the user mode, and then you have the kernel mode, right? And we don't realize, but you know, uh, we rely heavily on the kernel for a lot of the day-to-day -day interactions that we do, a lot of the work we do. Like for example, just opening a font file 
you actually are directly making calls to the kernel right and it has been done uh, mainly for performance but uh, it's kind of bad for security right uh, and so actually we, we talked about this to microsoft and actually they are looking at evaluating how they can uh, reduce this attack surface uh, which we'll exploit uh, later now in this talk so the idea is that the kernel is a huge attack surface. Uh, it's a huge, uh, humongous amount of code, probably 20 millions of lines of code at least, or probably a little bit more. Uh, so which means that there will always be bugs and there will always be vulnerabilities which can be exploited by, sand say, uh, by attackers, right? So, so that's kind of how uh, operating system works. Now uh, let's look at a type A sandbox. So that's the first category. This is what I said as sandboxy. So the idea is, so how our type A sandbox works is uh, it's basically a kernel driver and, uh, and the idea is to run untrusted code inside an encapsulated container. It's a virtualized uh, file system, virtualized container which is done at an application layer pretty much, right? And you have drivers which interact with the kernel and allow or disallow access. So uh, if you break it from an architecture perspective, this is how kind of uh, these sandboxes look. What you have is a kernel driver, right? And then uh, you have a sandbox process inside the sandbox. So the kernel driver basically makes a decision whether an API call can be made. Is it allowed or not allowed, right? Let me give you a quick demo of how it looks in real world. I should buy a license for a sandbox, I guess. So what I have done here is I have opened a command prompt inside a sandbox and then I open notepad outside the sandbox. So uh, I should not be able to kill the notepad process from the sandbox because it's it should not have access outside the sandbox, right? So I, I do a task kill. It says access denied, right? Which means that I don't have the privilege to kill anything outside the sandbox. And and I'll talk about uh, how we deal with that, uh, how we break out of that, and how we can access that once I go in the exploitation phase. But that's kind of how uh, type A sandbox looks like, right? Any questions? Right? It's a pretty straightforward model, uh, I would say, uh, from a design perspective. Uh, I would say this is the simplest type of sandbox available. Next is type B, which is uh, Google Chrome. This is probably the most sophisticated and the most advanced sandbox that you find uh, in real world, right? So, uh, and for uh, how, we have de how we are defining it is that you have a master and a slave. And how it works is uh, the slave is confined to what it can access and everything is channelized through the master. Right? Which means that master is like the, the traffic policeman. Uh, it's like it, it, it has policies and it decides what access is allowed and what is disallowed to the slave. Right? And the master has the smallest attack surface. It's the smallest amount of code base by design. The idea is that uh, to break out of the slave, uh, you should be able to break out of the master, which is going to be incredibly hard. That's why you see very few exploits for Chrome just because of this simple uh, granular model, how they have defined and architected this, right? Uh, and these are probably the most popular uh, applications. I guess everybody uses Chrome here. You should be using IE, I'm just kidding, anyways. <laughs> so uh, the master has a smaller, has a very small code base. Uh, so the idea is that it will be dif very difficult to break and exploit it. And the slave is a renderer which has all the rich goody stuff, the HTML5, all the uh, rendering uh, objects, everything is inside the slave, right? So it will be far more easier to find a vulnerability in the slave. So if you look at the, the Chrome uh, uh, patches, the bugs they face, fix, there are probably hundreds of uh, patches for the renderer, right? So there are lots of vulnerabilities which are there, but they cannot be exploited because to exploit that, you have to break out of the master. 
and that's the kind of the secret sauce why it is it has been so successful in the world today right but the problem here is that the slave has to still directly interact with the kernel right so if my kernel got compromised or if i had a, have a kernel vulnerability i could possibly break out of the master and completely bypass the master and it's an architectural limitation right and also the slave uh, which we actually found later in our research uh, also has access to some user mode components which is one more attack surface which we will exploit in a bit a little bit on how it works because this is kind of uh, very interesting how they have designed uh, google team so uh, you this is kind of the master uh, you have the it's kind of control all the communication happens via ipc mechanism right and this is the sandbox uh, and uh, the master decides via the policy what accesses are allowed what are disallowed right so for example the slave uh, runs with low privileges uh, for instance restricted tokens uh, uh, job object desktop object integrity levels these are the os controls available to uh, minimize uh, the the access to the slave uh, and interestingly, uh, 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 as per the Chromium uh, open source project, uh, uh, it's not as hardened as you would imagine. For instance, uh, mounted FAT and FAT32 party, uh, volumes, there is no protection today as per the open source Chromium project. And for TCP IP, there is no protection. Uh, and then access to most other stuff is pretty much, uh, I would say, confined and available, which is probably good enough from a security standpoint from an architectural standpoint right so this is how it works so if you if you make a f uh, like a file access call uh, today uh, in the chrome browser this is what happens behind the scenes uh, so this is uh, 2856 pid is the slave and this is the master so here you are trying to access this dll uh, the slave uh, needs to access this netscan the dll and it's uh, the moment it accesses it uh, it gets an access denied right uh, and then it has to request to the master that a hey, master i need to access the dll can you please request me uh, can you please give me access and the master uh, basically decides that okay this is allowed and it duplicates the file handle and ultimately it gives access uh, to the slave so all of this happens via named pipes uh, mechanism so which you uh, so this is actually a proc uh, procmon view so procmon doesn't look at name pipes but this is what happens behind the scene for every action you do in chrome browser this is how it works the inner workings of a chrome browser right so uh, so the question is now uh, how resistant uh, is master to a malicious slave right uh, and this is what most people have been working on uh, 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 the idea is that, and that's kind of the de behind the the whole concept behind the design of the Chrome sandbox, right? We expect the m that the slave is going to be malicious, so master has to be resilient to those attacks from the slave, right? And most of the past research has been in that direction, but it has been changing towards the other side, which is how resistant is the operating system to a malicious slave? Now that we know that the slave has direct access to certain OS components, what if there was an OS vulnerability which I could leverage from the slave, right? And this is kind of what we focus on. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the Pontoon contest, uh, have you heard about that Pontoon contest? So uh, last year, around the time when we published uh, our first, uh, first uh, paper, the MWR labs also bypassed Chrome using a kernel vulnerability. And they got a good bounty prize, which is kind of cool, right? Uh, Google is apparently giving lots of cash this year as well, from what I hear. But it's for the Chrome OS. Nobody uses Chrome OS. Anyways. So uh, Master Slave uh, Sandbox on a, on a Windows Adobe Reader. This is how it looks like. So if you open the properties uh, of your Adobe Reader, you will see that the low integrity level it, it it limits the network connectivity it limits a lot of accesses which are like controls from the operating system so this is how the adobe sandbox has been implemented and you know what adobe and chrome are part of the same project which is the chromium project but the implementation is very different uh, from security standpoint the hardening and the work involved has been very different uh, 
And then, so for, from a, for Adobe Reader, uh, there's a lot of uh, work. In fact, uh, one of the first malware was identified in the wild uh, in February last year, uh, which broke the Adobe Reader sandbox. And this was, I think, just, I guess, a year after Adobe said that they had zero malware. So kind of a, not a good claim to make, I guess. So, but that malware uh, was a complex malware. Why was it complex? It was because the, the vulnerability which was exploited was in the master. So you, do, you have to have multiple vulnerabilities to pivot out of the sandbox, right? So uh, I think that there are easier ways to break out of the Adobe Reader instead of doing, going that approach. And that's what we'll be talking about now, okay? Uh, so this is the Chrome browser. Uh, Chrome browser is far more robust in terms of security. They have invested a lot of money, a lot of effort. They have some very smart guys in Google who are hardening the browser all the time. So if you see uh, right here, you, you see something called untrusted integrity level. This is far more uh, restrictive than the one that Adobe Reader has, right? So just a simple hardening point of view, Adobe Reader hasn't been as hardened as Chrome, although they use the same architecture, right? Which is kind of interesting, which means that you know, PDF bugs, you know, now you know why PDF bugs are so common. Anyways, uh, for Chrome, uh, it is far more deep privileged than what's publicly available. Like as per the Chromium project, you can access FAT32 system, file, file mounting and so on, but uh, for the Chrome browser, uh, first of all, you have the untrusted integrity level, and then uh, the access to FAT32 file system is completely denied which means that even if you compromised, uh, you will have to do a lot more work to bypass all these restrictions and compromise the user and infect the machine, right? Okay, so uh, most of the attacks in the Chrome browser, again, have been targeted at the master. Have you heard of Pinkie Pie, uh, the expert by Pinkie Pie? So uh, I think it was a couple of years back, uh, one guy wrote a, an incredible exploit to break out of the Chrome, uh, Chrome browser. I think he won the bounty prize. I think it was like five or six vulnerabilities hopping around and it was an incredibly, it was a masterful exploit to write, right? Uh, but those exploits are very difficult. I would say they are far rare. And uh, I would say from a malware point of view, very few people would really l write those kind of exploits, unless it's like a nation state targeted attack. Most of the malware guys are, I would say, lazy guys, as most of us, and they want the easy way out. So, uh, so and that's what, you know, uh, I think uh, those kind of exploits will kind of, uh, are not real world in terms of, from a malwareable point of view, which kind of proves the point of the sandbox, right? So now, uh, 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 have you heard of the BPF syscall filter? So this is, uh, this is a project on, on the Linux operating system, uh, and actually Chrome uses that. So as, uh, as you saw in the previous, uh, my previous slides, Chrome is vulnerable to the kernel uh, attacks because of the exposure to kernel attack, kernel layer. However, uh, the, this BPF syscall filter uh, limits the syscalls, and it kind of uh, reduces the attack surface dramatically on the Linux operating system. So this is a far more robust architecture. And uh, however, still, uh, you know, uh, Chrome has gone further ahead, and you know, even if you exploited the slave, you still have to do a lot of work. For instance, uh, if you need to create a process, uh, if you need to alter specific uh, uh, registry locations, you cannot do all of that. It's completely blocked in Chrome. These are like special extra effort added in the browser. However, win32k.sys is completely open. It's like out there in the beach, you know, having fun. You know? So it's completely exposed, you know. So this is kind of a huge attack surface. And uh, last year, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, there were like close to 80 patches on the Windows kernel. Probably 80% of them were on win 32 k sys, and they were from Google guys, you know. So it's, it's, it's obvious that they know about this attack surface and they are trying to harden it as much as they can. Okay, so that was the architectural stuff and now um, 
I will talk about, I'll get into the exploitation stuff, which is kind of the fun bits, right? So, uh, one couple of slides on how kernel exploits work, right? So, so if you are inside a sandbox, how would a kernel exploit work, right? So how it works so today is, uh, if you are an application inside a sandbox, the, you say uh, that, dear kernel, you know, please open a file for me, and the file is at location at address X, for instance, right? And the kernel uh, points to allowed file dot text. It's an allowed, as you saw the API control uh, in the sandbox, right? Uh, and it says, here is the file handle for you, right? And then the sandbox application says, uh, dear kernel, please open a file for me. And the file name is at address Y. Uh, but the kernel says, you know what? This points to a location called secret file. And uh, you are a sandbox application. And I cannot let you access that file. So as I just showed in my demo, in the, when I did the sandbox demo, I could not kill notepad.exe. That's exactly how it works. The, and the enforcement happens like that. Right? This is how it's implemented in the kernel. However, uh, supposing you had a malicious uh, user or, or a malicious uh, exploit coming out there, how it would work? So the sandbox application will say, dear kernel, uh, please draw the text hello world uh, for me using the true type font. The true type font is, by the way, the most beautiful font I've seen. You know, All the cool exploits. Have you heard of Doq? It uses the true, true type font. It's kind of fun stuff. Anyways, so, uh, so it's stored at address X. Now the kernel will say, okay, you know what, you're a sandbox application, but using a font is a natural, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a good natural thing to do, right? You have to use a font. I cannot block that. So you, you need it to access, you need to access it to function properly. So you know what, uh, before I give you access to that, I need to parse the font, right? And then uh, while Passing the font, the kernel corrupts its own memory uh, because there was a bug there, there's a vulnerability there in the font. Uh, and after that memory corruption, uh, the kernel starts executing code at X, uh, which where it can do anything it wants. Right? Basically, you have complete control over the machine out there from there on. Okay. So now uh, I, I start the exploit. So this is kind of my kernel. So this is the list of kernel exploits uh, which have been there for the past uh, 18 months. So we select one exploit called uh, the SysThread exploit. It was found by actually my coworker at Bromium Labs. And uh, so this is kind of the kernel hacker there, out there, right inside. So what I'll do is now I'll do a breakout uh, out of the sandbox using a kernel exploit. Okay. So here what I do is I run the exploit. I need the PID of, uh, of the process which I'm going to exploit. I'll explain that in a bit. So what I do now is I run a kernel exploit. And after I exploit the kernel, I have the same privilege as that of the driver of the sandbox, right? You remember the architecture of the, of the sandbox? And then what I do is I pivot out of the sandbox by migrating to a process called win init, which is of PID 384, right? So uh, just check out the exploit now. No blue screen, that means it's a good sign. So as you can see, uh, I ran a kernel exploit, and and after that I migrated to the host. Now I have complete control over the machine. You, if you see, if I, I did a who am I? I'm kernel. I'm system right now. The sandbox has been completely breached, 
right? To demonstrate that I'll just kill the notepad which I was not able to kill earlier, right? Game over, right? So this was a complete break out of the sandbox. And, and the, the problem here is, uh, The problem here is that this is an architectural limitation. You cannot do anything about it. This is a design uh, limitation. You, it just, you cannot solve this problem because this is, if your kernel is vulnerable, what can you do about it, right? Uh, so is this a problem? How, is this a, like a serious problem? Is this like a, just a, this is like a joke? Uh, well, uh, last, uh, in, in the year uh, uh, 2012, uh, 2012, there were around 25 CVEs, 25 kernel patches from Microsoft. Last year, there were 80 plus CVEs in the, on the kernel, right? Which means that it's a huge attack surface, more vulnerabilities are occurring more frequently, and uh, recently we found a variant of the TDL4 rootkit, which was exploiting a kernel vulnerability which can pretty much bypass any of these sandboxes in the wild, right? And the worst part is, you know, you have been warned. I mean, uh, uh, kind of, it didn't come out. I should have used a black font, I guess. Anyways, uh, it's a large attack surface. You cannot do much about this. Application sandboxes are fundamentally vulnerable to this. You cannot solve this problem. This is a design architecture limitation, right? Any questions on this so far? Yes, so I, I have a, I have a, my last expert does that, answers your question. I'll, I'll come to there, I'll, I'll answer that question in, in 10 minutes, okay? Anything else for the kernel exploit so far? No, okay, good, great. So, uh, so when we did this, you know, uh, people came and said, okay, you know what, uh, kernel exploits are, kernel exploits are tough and, uh, how many people can write a kernel exploit and you know, so we said okay fine, let's look at what else is possible in that world, right? So what we did is actually we sat down and looked at the various sandboxes and what is the attack surface exposed uh, to the operating system, right? What else is possible which is non-kernel based but in the user, user mode because apparently some people think that user mode exploits are easier to write, which probably might be true in some cases, right? So then what we found was, uh, uh, type A and type B sandboxes do not restrict network connectivity for a sandbox process, right? Uh, and Google Chrome again is an exception. They have uh, hardened this uh, so that even if the net, uh, renderer got exploited, uh, it's still very difficult to come out of it. It will still be confined in, in, those con in, in that context, right? However, uh, if you do an RPC dump on, on local host of, uh, on, on a sandbox process, you will see that at least 18 plus named uh, you know, interfaces which are available and exposed right now, right? Which means that a vulnerability in any of these services can be abused to break out of the sandbox. Yet again, again and these are user mode components, right? So, uh, so what we found was ALPC ports. Uh, have you heard of ALPC port? These are the advanced local procedure calls. This is a low level uh, mechanism used for inter-process communication uh, uh, on the Windows operating system. And there are many services which listen at ALPC ports. And uh, if a sandbox can connect to these uh, services, uh, it can basically attempt to exploit a vulnerability in it. Right, uh, and the Type A sandbox are completely open and exposed uh, to these uh, to this attack surface, right? So, uh, so what we did is we did a comparison of Adobe Reader and Chrome, like you know uh, how much security hardening has happened behind the scenes. So, if you do a dump RPC dump, uh, this is on the in the kernel debugger. If you look at the ALPC ports, if you do ALPC uh, ALPC bang uh, LPP, you will see that uh, uh, there are a bunch of services uh, which are actually exposed uh, for both Adobe Reader and Chrome, and this is kind of the attack surface. However, Chrome has much fewer than Adobe Reader, right? 
And uh, interestingly, if you see this in Adobe Reader, they, you have access to LSAS, which is kind of uh, a very bad idea, I would say. Uh, why? Because what I could do now is, in theory, I haven't tried this, I could send you a PDF document, brute force your LSAS, steal your local user passwords, and upload it to a server without exploiting anything. Just a PDF. Right? So this is the problem of exposing something like LSAS to the renderer. Bad idea. Right? So this hasn't happened yet. Uh, we might see it, I guess, in the future. So I have, we have already notified the Adobe security team, and they are aware of this. But, uh, but to make our work easier, uh, we selected the, the common denominator, which is CSRSS. So we wanted to kind of, you know, wanted to be lazy a bit, you know, and wanted to uh, use uh, the same exploit for all the various sandboxes. So we used uh, CSRSS. So uh, what we did is we sat down and looked at all the various vulnerabilities in CSRSS and see, okay, what is possible out here? You know, CSRSS is exposed for pretty much every sandbox we have encountered, right? And then we came across this very interesting vulnerability which was, uh, which was patched and very few people know about it. There was no exploit available. Nobody has talked about it. It silently went quiet. So this is the vulnerability description. The vulnerability is caused by CSRSS improperly validating permissions when a low integrity process communicates a device event message to a high integrity process. Huh. As cryptic as it can be, right? Microsoft KB. So anyways, the reality is the vulnerable versions of CSRSS perform no validation or no permission check blindly executing post messages with all parameters controlled by the peer. That is really, really bad, right? Which is a, it's a design flaw. So have you heard of shat shatter attacks way back in the early 2000s? It's kind of a shatter attacks happening again uh, in this day and world, right? Going back, back to the future, as, as they say. So now what we do is that I will use this vulnerability and then I will break out of all the sandboxes using a user mode exploit, right? And this is how it looks like. Yes, I'll pay for the license someday. Yeah. I think I need to just reboot my machine. I ran a kernel exploit last night, so I think it's unstable. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is what happens when at 1 a.m. you are you know, playing fiddling with kernel exploits. Yeah, it screws your demo, so.
Okay, so now is the fun stuff. So as you can see, I have two command prompts here. Let me take this out. So I have two command prompts here. One is with the with the pretty yellow bar uh, border, right? And the one which is on the host operating system, right? So what I will do is I will run a CSR as, as exploit, and then what I do is I do something very cute. Uh, I've given it my own name. It's called I'm doing remote keystroke injection. So from the sandbox, I inject into the command prompt outside the sandbox, and I can do pretty much anything I want to do. Game over, right? So let's look at this. Yes, the 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 yellow box, uh, the 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 box of the yellow border is actually uh, a sa the sandbox, right? So I'm inside and confined in the sandbox here, and the the box, the the command prompt without the yellow border is outside, so I should have no access to that, right? So what what I will do is that I'll break out of the sandbox and start injecting into the one outside, right? Okay. Okay, here we go. This is from the sandbox outside. Right? Which means that at this point, I can do anything I want. I can run a Trojan, I can do, this is like I can, I've completely breached the sandbox, right? This is the fun stuff. So what I do now is I uh, I just go to FTP and I log on to a remote server, right? Steal your confidential dot doc, right? Classify dot doc, and then upload it by and then I self destruct, right? I just kill myself and game over, complete bypass, right? So was it fun? <laughs> Cool. So that was uh, an exploit using CSRSS. Now you can now you can see that expression on the kitty, right? Holy crap! Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, so again, uh, so we kind of published a detailed paper. Uh, it's available on our website labs.bromium.com, uh, where we uh, have a full detail analysis on. Uh, various attack vectors and how you can bypass all of these sandboxes. And again, we are focusing on it from a very different viewpoint. We are not trying to break the sandbox. We are looking at the attack surface and how can we break out of the sandbox without breaking it by looking at vulnerabilities in the operating system itself. Because, you know, what are the chances that Microsoft won't have a bug? I'm pretty low, right? So I'm banking on that pretty much. You know, So I won't find a bug in your sandbox, but I'll find a bug in Microsoft and use that to break out of your sandbox. To, how do you deal with that now? Anyways, so so what we found was uh, the type A sandboxes. Uh, you know, if you do like metasploit testing, it's it blocks most exploits, which is kind of the uh, basic. Uh, I would say the bare minimum for sandbox testing. And then there, user mode and kernel exploit, which are exposed to the attack surface. It was very easy to break, as I just demonstrated. Uh, but the moment you find an OS vulnerability in CSRSS or or Win32 sys, you can break out of these very easily. However, for Chrome, it was much harder. Uh, it was much more harder uh, to break out of Chrome because of the additional hardening that has been implemented, right? And the other interesting thing we found was something called sandbox leakage. This is a new category we just created because it didn't exist, which is basically, uh, now that the malware is inside the sandbox, what can it do? Right, so we found that the malware ha could do key logging. So you are outside the sandbox, the malware in the sandbox, and you are going to your bank outside the sandbox. It can log your keystrokes. It has full access to what's happening, which is kind of dangerous, right? Uh, it can you can switch on your remote webcam. I can switch on your mic and start recording without you even being aware of this. The, the malware has full access to that, right? Clipboard. I have full access to your clipboard. So if you store your password in the clipboard, ha ha ha, it's gonna be fun. Uh, screen scraping, I could screen scrape. Although we found that Buffer Zone Pro had done something there uh, to disallow that. So we didn't try to break that. So we just put the, we just said, okay, it's medium. They they thought about it. Yes, 
Yes. So I kind of green is like uh, they did something about it. Yellow means that I had to think about it. Uh, red is like ah, nah, what's that? It's liquor. Yeah. Uh, yes, I would say so. Yeah. So uh, actually, PDF uh, Chrome has implemented their own PDF uh, reader version, uh, and it's it's kind of pretty sound from a security standpoint. Unless uh, you know, I haven't seen the implementation of the PDF when it comes to like kernel interfaces, because as I just demonstrated, uh, I can break out of Chrome or uh, any sandbox if it's if there's a vulnerability in say CSRSS or the kernel, right? So, but yes, I agree. Uh, it's uh, better to open a PDF than say than use Adobe Reader. Yeah. So network share access. You know what? Uh, from a sandbox, I had access to the network share. I can brute force your sand, uh, your network shares uh, accounts, and I can pretty much do anything I want from there. So I can do the fun lateral movement from the sandbox. Kind of bad to have that. Okay, so this is the exploit which you were asking about, right? So then we were asked, uh, what if I put a sandbox in a sandbox? You know, uh, what if I put a, a, a browser inside a sandbox? Uh, will that help, right? So, so I call it uh, defense in depth indeed, right? So this exploit, what I do is uh, I put uh, Google Chrome inside sandboxy and then bypass both, right? So uh, this is the kind of going back there where I open Notepad uh, and I am now I opened a command prompt I open Notepad this is on the host there's no sandbox involved right uh, now I go and open a, a, a sandbox which is sandboxy in this case and and then I open a command prompt uh, right you see the the pretty yellow border. Right, uh, which is which means that I'm inside the sandbox, right? And I and now I cannot kill the process outside the sandbox. It's denying me access, right? So uh, and as you can see at Process Explorer, uh, this is uh, uh, this is basically uh, medium medium integrity uh, from an uh, access control point of view. Now uh, what I do is I go and open Chrome uh, from the sandbox. So that Chrome is inside the sandbox, right? Google uh, application Chrome. Chrome application. Right? So now I have Chrome inside the sandbox. So you can see that Chrome has a pretty yellow border as well. So now you have a sandbox inside a sandbox, right? Okay. And the sandbox works. You can go to google.com, right? So it's a functional sandbox. Okay. Now, if you look at it, uh, the important part to note here is uh, that this is untrusted. The Chrome.exe is untrusted, which means that it's a very hardened sandbox with very limited access. It can't do much, right? It's hardened by by Google. And uh, now, what we do is that we run the exploit. So a little bit about how I'm using the exploit now. So what I do is that I, I simulate a vulnerability in the renderer. There are like hundreds of vulnerabilities in the renderer. I, I assume that a, the renderer has a vulnerability. So I inject into the renderer. And from there, I load a, a font file. Supposing, you know, if you, if you go visit a website which had a font file, right? I load a font file. And uh, the moment I load the font file, uh, I will uh, basically that f I'll inject a kernel payload, and basically uh, this is the doq exploit. Uh, the doq malware was found in the wild a couple of years back. Uh, it is kind of uh, known to be one of the most sophisticated malware found, almost like Stuxnet kind of caliber, because the exploit is pretty cool actually. Uh, we actually spent some time uh, uh, reversing the doq malware to kind of recreate this exploit, right? So, so now uh, I inject into the PID of the renderer, which is 1712, right? And then uh, this is the font, T2 embed, this is the font which Google has to load to run. And then I inject exploit DLL.dll, right? 
So as you can see, you can see a calculator pop up, uh, which means that the exploit worked. And, and this, is, this has medium integrity which means that you know, I was able to do something there. But I think you might want to see something more interesting than a calculator. So what, what I do now is uh, I do the same mechanism wherein I pivot out of the, both the sandboxes using win init, uh, which is of PID uh, 388 here, right? So uh, I, I wake up the, the, uh, the port for 49152 of that, and then I do a bind shell and then I basically listen on that, right? Which means that uh, at this point, I get, if I do a who am I, I have completely pawned the machine. It's game over. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so how it works is that I'm assuming that you go to a bad website, right? So in this case, you're inside the sandbox, right? So everything in the sandbox is untrusted, right? So th uh, this could be a URL, for instance, where I visit to a URL and then I click on a link which loaded a bad font file and then I exploit the font file vulnerability and then I break out of the sandbox. This is a simulation, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the font is the malicious font. So the font has a vulnerability, uh, and the kernel is parsing the font, right? And when it's parsing the the malformed font file, will cut up the kernel memory and then break out of the sandbox. Right? Yeah. Yeah. This is a Windows 7. But it should work on 2008 also, yeah. Uh, I haven't tried 2012. This was the, that's a server-side platform, right? So this is more on the client side. Uh, but uh, I think it should work on 2012. Uh, but the thing is that the, the vulnerability I use is a slightly old one, so we have to look for a newer vulnerability. Uh, so it, it's, I'm just using a vulnerability which is kind of known instead of finding a zero day. The idea is to prove a point on the architecture limitation, right? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, so uh, I agree. Uh, every Windows version is more secure than the previous one. That, that's how it works, right? <laughs> That's that's how it works all the time. Yeah, every year is like that. So, uh, so any questions so far on this? So out here, basically, uh, to demonstrate that I have broken out. Of, yeah. Right. So I just reverse engineered the patch. <laughs> I, I reverse engineered the patch from Microsoft. So there's something called patch diffing. So since the description looked interesting, so we selected which patches to look for. So what we did is like how it works is you take a, uh, the, the DLL version which was patched and the one prior to that, and then we do something called binary diffing, right? So when you diff the patches, you know which function or which areas were patched by Microsoft, right? And then you try to figure out what they're trying to patch there. And then from there, we write an exploit code to basically uh, to see, okay, what they actually patch. So there's kind of a lot of work involved behind the scenes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I would say that uh, this was issue was kind of uh, went unnoticed by a lot of people. Uh, in fact, and, and the guy who found this exploit is a very smart guy, Alex, uh, from uh, Sys Internal, or uh, Windows, uh, he's, he's written the book, right? The Windows Internals uh, book. Uh, so he must have found it while doing some research. So the bug was a pretty serious bug. Uh, and I'm sure, like, similarly, a uh, lot of these bugs, not everybody sits and reverses patches because it's a very time-consuming process. It, l it requires a lot of resources and motivation, right? Uh, so yeah, it's just, it took us a weekend or whatever, so extra uh, to get there. Uh, simply 
because we were trying to look at CSRS's reliable exploits, right? So if you look at the CSRS exploit, why I choose that is simply because there is no memory corruption there, you know? Uh, so I didn't have to deal with ASLR or DEP or any of those in my payloads. It, uh, the, the code is very simple. It's like uh, 25 lines of code because it's a design flaw implementation in CSRSS. So that's why we choose that. So we actually reversed the patch. We did the binary diffing, and we found the root cause. And then that's how. And then we extracted that and wrote an exploit to kind of uh, demonstrate this. Yeah, there was some work in the background. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's it's kind of tough uh, uh, when you know when you deal with such issues, right? Because see. Just imagine if you are look at from a large organization. You know, this is the way I talk about this to people. You know, so the game is uh, the game. We have why we are losing the malware problem is simply because it's a game of odds, right? So it's assume that uh, you know uh, each one of you is the smartest person on the planet, right? And you make one mistake a year, right? And there are ten thousand of you in a large company, right? Probably more in a bigger company, right? So all you have to do is just make one mistake and your organization is compromised, right? So all people have to do is send you a blast of spear phishing emails. Somebody is likely going to click on them because, you know, for some, some, for some people, they have to click, you know. You're, if your job is to uh, scan resumes, you have to open PDFs. There is no, you, you, how do you work without it, right? So it, it's a, I would say it's a tough problem because even if uh, you and I were like good friends, I have no idea that your email got compromised the previous night and it's the attacker sending me an email. It's very difficult for us to really figure those out, right? That's why user education can go that far, but I think fundamentally the products what we have uh, have to solve uh, these problems. And I'll talk about that a little bit in, in my last slide on the mitigations you know, and what we have learned from this so far, right? So I have five minutes. So yeah, this is kind of the expert. This is game over, boom, right? Okay. So let's come back to the slide. So what have we learned? So yeah, so this is kind of, uh, I'm kind of trademarking this term, defense in depth indeed. So it's kind of, anyway, anyways. So so conclusion, right? Uh, uh, so, so we need to really understand, you know, we, we keep on adding more and more layers on our endpoint solution targeting specific attack vectors. And then what happens is that our machines become slow, right? So there's no depth of protection in pretty much most of the solutions we use today, right? And application sandbox is just one of them. So it's very important to understand the architectural limitations, you know? This is something which cannot be fixed. You know, you cannot do anything about it. This is a design limitation. So kernel attacks, uh, application sandboxes are fundamentally vulnerable to kernel attacks, right? And some user mode components to which they are exposed to. Uh, breaking out of a sandbox, as I demonstrated, is a far more efficient way. It's, it provides you far better ROI than breaking the sandbox itself. Because the sandbox objective is to harden the code and reduce the attack surface, right? But the chances that you find a vulnerability in the OS is much better. And so you should, you're better off using an exploit like this, right? So, uh, and then we found that in our analysis, uh, type A sandboxes were far easier to break out of than type B, simply because type B sandboxes like Chrome and Adobe Reader are designed just for one application, not for any arbitrary application. So the hardening you can do can be very targeted, and you, you can do a much better job in making sure the attack surface is limited, right? But, uh, but a type A sandbox like Sandboxy is like a very generic platform. Uh, it is not robust enough. And you know what? Some people actually do malware analysis inside sandboxes like Sandboxy. Don't do that. You know, that's bad things will happen. So, so really avoid that. Uh, uh, so one of the solutions is to provide a depth of protection. You can use a VM-based solution where you have like a virtualized stack of your whole operating system. So even if there's a kernel vulnerability inside the VM sandbox, uh, you can't break out of it. You have to break out of the hypervisor, which is far more difficult than say breaking out of a sandbox itself, right? And then like CSRSS, all these vulnerabilities are no longer a problem there. So that's an alternative. Yeah. Yes, I mentioned that, yeah. 
that's that's a pretty cool. And in fact, uh, when I went to Blue Hat earlier this year, we told Microsoft that you know, can we have something like this, please? You know, on Windows. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the the Google guys have done a lot more work on hardening Chrome. Extra work has been implemented, uh, done. Uh, I kind of mentioned it in some of my earlier slides. Uh, they have done a lot of extra work. I, I've kind of mentioned that in the paper, uh, uh, which I just mentioned about. We have a detailed paper on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know how it works because Adobe Reader is using Chromium, and you know what? They haven't done the amount of hardening as what Chrome has done, you know? So, uh, 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 yeah, uh, I haven't, I haven't, I, I don't know why, even the public, the, the published version of open source Chrome uh, is, uh, is, I would say, uh, f is not up to date with the security updates on Chrome. Chrome is like the cutting edge, and Chrome is kind of, I would say, a little bit behind. Uh, simply because I guess it's open source, but now Chrome is like Google's flagship uh, browser or whatever, and they're competing with Microsoft, right? So I guess that's the reason. Uh, but it is not up to date, I can tell you for sure, at least when I check last. So uh, uh, acknowledgments, my colleague Rafael Wojcik, who worked with me on this paper, uh, this paper is available to download from labs.bromium.com. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to ping me on Twitter. This is my Twitter ID. Uh, and or on email uh, or wherever on the internet, right? So I think I just have, I think I'm just on time. I just did it, yes. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Right, so uh, Adobe Reader and Chrome, uh, like you cannot have Adobe Reader inside Chrome, uh, like because you, you have they have a plugin for it, yeah. Whatever is there, but the, the point is that uh, uh, I haven't played with the plugin. But the problem is that the moment there's a kernel interaction, I can still break. The the, the point is that even if you layer sandboxes as I demonstrated, sandbox in a sandbox, uh, I'm accessing the kernel directly, so I'm bypassing the architecture. You cannot do anything about it. I can still bypass those as well. Doesn't matter. In a VM, yeah, in a VM, yeah. That's probably the only way out, I would say. Yeah, yeah, we're done. Thank you. Thank you.